As hundreds of indie games are released every year, some are bound to leave more lasting impressions than others. Seriously, how is this not a top seller? If you've ever played Inscription by developer Daniel Mullins, for example, I'm sure you can picture that dimly lit room playing cards against a weird tree man. And if you remember Daniel's other game, Pony Island, you could probably envision that pixelated pony jumping and shooting lasers at demons, and not that other game with the same name. But when trying to think of his third game, The Hex, you might be drawing some blanks. And why is that? While being released between the other two, it's pretty much the middle child of the three. Not only that, but both Pony Island and Inscription have a very recognizable aesthetic and gameplay loop, whereas the Hex's weirder looking art style and gameplay are less appealing at first glance, which is probably why most big YouTubers decided to skip it. Pass. What if I were to tell you it looks this way on purpose? I know that sounds like I'm inhaling some dubious amounts of copium, but just hear me out. You see, Daniel's trademark style is presenting the player with something seemingly simple on the surface, only to subvert those expectations and turn it into a much deeper story. For example, Pony Island appears to be a cute homage to that no internet dinosaur game, but it's actually a game where your soul is trapped in purgatory and the devil is trying to drag you to hell. Quite the leap. When it comes to the Hex, it's actually a clever and hilarious commentary on the gaming industry through the eyes of six former video game protagonists, who have all somehow ended up at the Six Pint Inn, a tavern, ironically, in a forgotten corner of the video game universe. Think of that one scene from Wreck-It Ralph where all those bad guys are in a support group. However, this is less of a support group and more of a crime scene, or should I say soon to be crime scene, as an anonymous tipper claims someone is planning a murder. So it's our job to figure out who done it before they actually done it. Admittedly, this premise isn't terrible, but because of the art style, it gives real Scribblenauts unmasked energy. It may not have the aesthetic or visual appeal of the other games, but it makes up for that by having some of that juicy lore. Just wanted to quickly preface, it's best to go into this game fairly blind, so I'd highly recommend playing it for yourself if you really want to dive deeper. You see, the devil is in the details. In this case, that's very literal. Every inch of the hex is chock full of details referencing or foreshadowing various events in the Daniel Mullins verse. Basically meaning all of these games are interconnected. I could go into every little detail, but this video would be way too long. Like, five and a half hours long. As of right now, I have played all of Daniel's games, and I don't exaggerate when I say they are extremely weird and go in directions I never would have predicted. And the Hex is no different. It may not be everyone's cup of tea, but if you're willing to give it a chance, let Daniel cook. And by the end, you'll be well fed. Speaking of which, you know what they say about variety, it's the spice of life. It seems like Daniel wanted a seven course meal of it, because he packs in quite a lot of different genres into this one game. Oh yeah, so remember how those characters used to be protagonists? Well, it's our job to play through their old memories being in those games to see if they have an alibi or murderous intent. Each of them have a specific genre of game that they're from. We got fighting games, turn-based RPGs, and Baba G. They even make a reference to the famous 2D platformer, Super Jump World. The idea of having more than one genre is great, as it switches games before you can really get too bored. Although some sections are longer than others, they constantly evolve and throw curveballs at every turn. But you're probably wondering who these characters even are. Let's start from the top with Super Weasel Kid, the furry of the group. His game, aptly named Super Weasel Kid, has you jumping on groomdas and collecting coins as these abominations stare at your soul. Plus, if you've been having difficulty with some other games, don't worry, in this one, they've made it impossible to lose. Next up is Bryce, who's the Six Pine Inn's head chef. The temperature's perfect. Originally from a cooking game, Bryce was bought out and transferred to a fighting game called Combat Arena X. No complicated controls here. This is where the big boys play. Funnily enough, one of the more powerful fighters in the game is a woman. Which brings me to the goth GF sorceress, Chandrell, who was originally from the same game, but pulled an Akuma from Street Fighter 2 Turbo. Basically, she became too OP and got herself banned. Afterwards, she got transferred to a turn-based fantasy RPG, Secrets of Legendaria. The art style of which is genuinely nice. Since this is a single player game though, it's pretty much impossible for Chandrell to get banned. Or is it? Moving on to the next protagonist, Rust McLean, who if you couldn't tell from his rugged outfit and gas mask, is from a post-apocalyptic grid-based strategy game named Wasteworld. I would have called it Outfall, but what do I know? Rust is a sharpshooter alongside his son, Rocky, who looks like he consumed a little too much brain rot. Then we got Lazarus, doing his best Avatar cosplay. He was from the same game as Chandrell, but got slotted into the top-down shooter, Vicious Galaxy 2, known for making characters go from looking like this, to this. But when you got a soundtrack that goes this hard, I'd personally stick with it. Last but not least is this guy. 
He doesn't have a name or a face for that matter, but hey, at least he's got that Reddit mod drip. As you probably guessed, he's from a walking sim called Walk, which goes through the life of the developer as he created the games we just played. So more like a self-insert then, which is fitting as throughout the game we hear some interesting developer commentary. Her ego was just too big to stand in the shadow of my greatness. Hmm. I know what you're thinking, pretty based. I mean, how could Daniel say such a thing? But this is not Daniel Mullins. Okay, well the picture is, but I'm talking about the voice. Remember when I said the game looks this way on purpose? Well, in universe, these games were developed by a teenager named Lionel. Snill, not messy. He made Super Weasel Kid when he was only 12, making it his first published game. Little fun fact, Lionel's name is actually a play on Daniel Mullen's name spelled backwards. Almost like he's Daniel's antithesis. Without giving too much away, the decisions that Lionel makes outside of the games directly affects what happens to the in-game characters. And because they're self-aware, it often leads to them breaking the fourth wall. I know breaking the fourth wall has become a tired trope by this point, but this came out in 2018 and I think it pulled it off pretty well. In this case, it comes in the form of not-so-secret shortcuts, oh, way too grindy boss, infinite collectibles, nice, and the ability to skip entire tutorials. <laughs> All of which the characters acknowledge. Hmm, do you have my queen's anks? Yep, must be at least 36 here. Hmm, they smell like, are these bugged anks? Nope. Oh, are you sure? Positive. Hmm, well, okay, you may pass. Another method he uses is implementing fake player feedback. Here they show up as Steam reviewers, as well as Twitch chatters. You can tell this was from 2018 because they're still using the old PogChamp emote. He really utilized the chat as one particular chatter would drop in to give answers to puzzles for you. Okay, how many eggs could a female cockatrice lay given a month for gestation period? Oh. It's 2734. Right. I just watched Trevor X play. One character that breaks the fourth wall most effectively is the dark clown Sado. I'm the Joker, baby! Fair warning, this is going to spoiler territory, but I feel like she's an important part of why this game is so unpredictable. Basically, she's a virus that causes chaos for the protagonists, corrupting anything and everything she touches. All to put on a show for the player. She uses parts of the game's UI, makes cheeky references to real games, and jump scares you when you least expect it. Uh. To add even more mystique around her, she's appeared in multiple games, even outside of Daniel's catalog. Breaking the fourth wall to the player is one thing, but breaking it to the in-game character, now we got ourselves some existential dread. Like I said before, the characters are supposed to be self-aware. However, Rust and his son Rocky have been method acting so much that they actually believe Waste World is real. So when they're told the game they've been living in hasn't even been finished, they begin to question their reality. But what would happen if the game mixes our reality and the in-game reality together? Well then you get an ARG. An ARG, or alternate reality game, basically uses the real world as a platform for a narrative that players can directly interact with and solve in real time. The Hex technically isn't an ARG, but it does have certain elements leaving hints here and there for players to figure out. None more interesting than the one lying just beneath the surface. Well, actually it's an entirely separate game called Just That. Beneath the Surface. A cute little game where you're ice fishing for various fish and, um, things. It's completely free to play on Steam if you want to check it out for yourself. I also wanted to point out this was a reused concept from one of Daniel's first game jams with the prompt also being beneath the surface. But essentially, the developer is credited as Carla51, which if you played the Hex, you would know Carla is the name of Lionel's friend who also created Sado. Now you're probably wondering where the ARG elements come into play. Well, while fishing, you come upon a locket with some random gibberish. It turns out this random gibberish is actually a code that I definitely decoded myself and didn't steal from people who put in the work to look for every single hidden clue. The decoded phrase translates to Lionel.exe, which when you type into beneath the surface, unlocks a secret ending to the hex. But before I spill the beans on that, I need to talk about the true ending. Obviously, massive spoiler warning again. Like I mentioned before, in every game we see how Lionel's decisions have affected each protagonist. Super Weasel Kid got a bad sequel and even worse remaster, Bryce was forced out of his love for cooking and his granny, Chandrell kept getting placed into games she wanted no part of, Russ just wanted a world where he and his son could live peacefully, this guy just wanted to face and voice, and Lazarus became jaded after slaughtering thousands of NPCs. I'm sure you can guess which one was the murderer. But funnily enough, the murder mystery we've been trying to solve was actually a red herring. Let me explain. 
At the end of Walk, Lionel's self-centered developer commentary, The other indie games coming out right now are crap, so Walk is a shoe in for Game of the Year, tells us to head through the glowing door to finish the game. But we're not gonna do that. You see, Lionel wasn't exactly transparent about his first game. Earlier, we're told by a hooded figure to walk back the way we came and glitch through a section of the barrier. Finding an ancient PC, we see Lionel's actual first game, Root Beer Tapper. I mean, Tender. Honestly, I don't really blame him for trying to hide this one. I'm sure you can recognize the protagonist as Reggie, the bartender in a wheelchair. Oh, but his legs are working just fine. I wonder if he just got older. Oh. So it turns out Irving, the assistant for the software Lionel used, crippled Reggie because Lionel was too embarrassed to show that Root Beer Tender was his first game. As an act of revenge, Reggie gathered all of Lionel's disgruntled creations to one place, so he could open the Hex. Ah, there's the name of the game. As it opens, we see Lionel using his 144p webcam. Now, the creator meets his creations. I'm sure Reggie has nothing but kind words to say to him. Looks like he choked on his aspirations. Now that I've shown you the true ending, let's go back to that secret ending I mentioned earlier. So after typing lionel.exe into beneath the surface, it loads in a prototype version of Walk with extra developer commentary from Lionel. He talks about the rumors of game characters being sentient. If they are true, he'd like to apologize to Rupier Reggie for shutting his game down. He then reveals that he modeled Reggie after his late grandfather makes it all the more tragic that Reggie was the one to ultimately unalive Lionel as he was completely unaware of this confession. Still, Lionel was kind of a dick, so rip bozo. And that's The Hex, a hyper self-aware meta commentary on the gaming industry with a ton of details for you to sink your teeth into. Yeah, the gameplay isn't as in-depth as its younger brother, and its puzzles aren't as clever as its older brother, but what it does right is provide a compelling mystery woven throughout multiple games, all while being incredibly funny. Congrats, uh New formation! Since it also has six, well, technically seven protagonists, it's easy to attach yourself to at least one of them. Chandra and Lazarus best pairing, and it's not even close. And the payoff at the end brought everything full circle. Or should I say, full hexagon. <laughs> With the new Pony Island 2 coming out in 2025, I'm excited to see what Daniel Mullins concocts up next. Although, I do feel like we're forgetting someone. Oh no, she got out!